Hello, welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour. This is Aaron LeBauer, your host, and today my special guest is Eric Bach. Eric is a fitness professional. He is the founder of Bach Performance, where he helps busy professionals look good naked without living in the gym, which I love that. And he also runs Bach Business Coaching. So it's a business coaching program for um, trainers and fitness professionals. Uh, so they can create custom uh, programs to retake control of their schedule and earn their financial freedom. Eric and I connected online because I'm always looking to fitness profession for marketing and sales and other great ideas to bring in the PT world. So thank you, Eric, for being on the show here today. I really appreciate you spending your time with us. Eric, thank you for having me. I was glad that, uh, glad that you reached out originally on Instagram. We had some discussions there and then, you know, obviously the relationship matured and here we are. Yeah, that's awesome. And we also both live in Greensboro. Exactly. But I'm in North Carolina and you're in Georgia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A little bit different, but yeah. you know, same region. So yeah. that kind of counts for extra, right? Yeah, that's awesome. So is it um, Nathaniel Green or some other green guy that Greensboro, Georgia is named after, do you know? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I could not <laughs> tell you here. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't always the, uh, the first place I saw myself living, but you know, life always takes us on a journey and here we are. All right. That's awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about um, where you started? How did you get into fitness? Like, what was your what was your start? Like, you know, what's your why? What what was your path into getting into? Fitness? Yeah, yeah. My original thing getting into fitness was I was always a small guy growing up, and I wanted to more than anything succeed in sports. So you know, I'd been a good athlete. However, I had a late growth spurt. So um, I remember vividly one football practice, having running down the field and trying to tackle. Um, a, a teammate of mine, and this is when I, I grew up in Wisconsin, and getting absolutely pulverized, it just completely destroyed me, decleated me, took my breath away. And I remember just looking up at like the gray sky, the ground was, you know, just rock hard because it was falling in Wisconsin. And I was like, really, is this it? And I was, you know, he's kind of taunting me in the end zone. And I just remember getting up and feeling so completely, you know, pathetic and worthless at that time. And I kind of had a choice. You know, one of my coaches saw me, you know, saw my body language. You can tell when someone's hanging their head. And he pulled me up to the gym after that practice. Uh, it was the last place I wanted to go. But that's when I really started falling in love with the training process, seeing that, you know, building my body, what that could do for me physically and more than that, even mentally. Um, so for me, you know, it came down to improving sport performance. Um, luckily, my body caught up. I grew. I uh, had the work ethic because I had always felt slighted at that point. Um, so, you know, sports, my big you know, impulse in the beginning. Unfortunately, I had a, a series of injuries, which, you know, really forced me to spend a lot more time in the training room that I wanted. And uh, with that, though, I also started falling in love with the science, seeing the way that high quality athletic trainers were interacting with athletes, interacting with me and the difference that it made. So, you know, when I when I was done playing sports in college, I jumped, you know, I was right into kinesiology from the beginning. And I made a little bit of a pivot, realizing that, you know, at first I wanted to go into athletic training, physical therapy. But for me, I was like, how could I prevent maybe some of these same injuries that I had in the beginning? with smarter training practices from the get-go. So, you know, I, I jumped into the sports performance aspects, strength and conditioning coaching. Uh, after college, I moved out to, uh, to Denver, Colorado, worked under Steve Hess of the uh, Denver Nuggets, and um, also at a private facility, which was fantastic. Got a lot of experience both on the business side in terms of a bigger gym, but then also, you know, seeing the high-level athletic training performance. Uh, worked for a couple different different facilities in Denver, and at the same time, I was building my online business primarily through writing and through blogging and simply writing about the problems that my clients came into the gym with and talking about the solutions, knowing that if I help them specifically, the same information is going to help more people. And really that that's how everything grew from the ground up. It came from that simple place of what are the problems that my clients are having, the people that are already, that are already paying me and what are the solutions that I can provide to attract more people like them. And from that, you know, everything else is kind of stemmed. I, I never thought I'd be in a position now where, you know, I've got a, completely two complete online businesses. I'm working with other fitness professionals, but you know, when you focus on the process and just doing one thing at a time and trying to do it to the best of your ability and helping your clients, it's amazing where this field can take you. Right. That's awesome. So was there, <clears throat> was there like something like a, a time period in high school or college where like, okay, when I'm done, I'm going to do fitness because I know everyone around me was like, Oh, if you're not a lawyer, a doctor, or a business, you know, like a financial consultant or something, there was really no, you know, like it wasn't like, oh, Aaron, you can be a massage therapist. <laughs> yeah. That's how I started my career. You know, like, did you know, okay, nope, I'm not doing what these other people are doing. I'm going to go and do, you know, 
this because like, what was the thing that got yeah. you? Yeah, you know, I was really flying by the seat of my pants. So, um, you know, when it came to sports, it, when I chose a college, I, I chose a college that I could still continue to try to play football. And, you know, with that, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I like working out. I like the science aspect of it. So let's start with a kinesiology major and see how that goes. And then it was just the thing of going through the process and taking something that was a passion and just growing that aspect of it. And then, like I said, once the sports component was removed, it became, okay, well, I'm going to start working with some of the sports teams and working underneath the sports coaches, getting some experience directly there. So the first thing I really wanted to do, I mean, first it came from a love of sports, but then it became, okay, I kind of want to be a strength conditioning coach and really work with these, these athlete, athletes to optimize their performance and prevent a lot of these injuries from happening in the first place. And everything really grew from that point on. Um, you know, kind of going through that process, I, I started to learn, at least once I got out of college, that you're very ill-equipped for the business aspect of things. Right. Uh, you might have the science, you might have the practical knowledge, and obviously the passion to really help people transform their lives through fitness and through health. But without those other components, your message is not quite worthless, but you're going to be greatly uh, impaired in your ability to make a difference and reach people in the first place. Yeah. And so, one step led to the other. Yeah. What was the most important thing you did um, when established? Like, so I want to get into like how you became, how you got into business, and online business, but was there something during that time period that was um, like in a turning point or an important thing that you did that, uh, that, that, uh, that you would go back and say, okay, I ha you have to do that again, or I, would, I wouldn't cut that out of my trajectory. Is there something that you did or set up or who you worked with or something? Yeah, the first thing for me, and this is when I was, you know, my first job out of college, and I've been working in the gym, and this is when I just started writing. I just started writing about the problems that my clients had, because that's how I learned. That's how I consumed information, was reading, you know, different blogs and websites and research, and was simply just writing about those problems, and then I realized, I don't really have a whole lot of direction. I've got Eric Bach, fitness dot wordpress dot com i have no idea what this whole like internet like marketing aspect is and so i reached out to my first coach and that was john goodman who runs the personal trainer development center when he still did individual coaching and he really started giving me the foundational skills and what i needed to focus on and you know at that point i just bought it and listened you know i was very regimented you know after growing up in sports and being very focused with those things just being able to take orders from a coach and actually listen instead of trying to battle or say this won't work or this will work really gave me that foundation to experience how beneficial coaching is and really investing in others who have been in the position where you want to be so they can help you not make some of the same mistakes and accelerate mm -hmm. your progress and give you the foundational skills that you'll need to continue developing growing forward. So doing that at a young age, you know, really, really got the ball rolling. And then it was just the consistent small habits of creating quality content every day and, you know, gaining, gaining knowledge, you know, through action and, and continuing to build from that point on. That's, that's great. So <clears throat> would you say that, uh, we're talking about coaching, like your, your, your football, like having a football coach is just as important as having, like for your team is just as important as having a business coach, you know, is definitely, it, you know, cause I know definitely. that like a lot of people are like, Oh, I don't need a business or like, and maybe, you know, it's like, like, what is business coaching? And I know you, you work with business coaches as well as I do. Like while I'm on that top or on the top of like, what is it what has it done for you how is that helpful so that because a lot of people think oh like i can do it on my own right or i can figure this yeah. out and there's yeah of course you can but like what is how is, have you benefited from working with coaches whether it's for football training you know business yeah, you know, I think when it comes to that coaching perspective, it's having somebody of authority who has a clear cut plan will give you direct marching orders especially now there's so much information that's out there in any given way when I reflect back when I first started training, one of the big reasons I didn't have success in building my body, information overload. I try to grab like, too much information, try to take it from a million different places and wonder why it wasn't working. Well, I didn't have a clear cut path or a clear cut plan for success. When you have a coach who can look back at the experiences that they have, the experience they have with other clients, they can really help short circuit that aspect of it. So you have a better clear cut direction and the accountability to do so. And the accountability component is huge because when you invest in something, when you invest in the knowledge to learn and to make that difference in your life and your business, you're going to be so much more likely to actually take action. We've probably all been in the situation where somebody during a, a family holiday dinner has asked us, can I eat this? Can I eat that? Should I exercise like this? What about this new diet? And they value your opinion, no doubt, 
However, how many times will they actually take action on it? Many times they will not until there is that investment in terms of doing so. So when it comes to the coaching aspect, you know, it's, it's very I completely understand what it's like to, to invest in coaching when you do not have your finances in line where you're struggling to, to make ends meet. But it's one of those things where it's a, it's a compounding investment. My biggest regret is not even hiring coaching sooner and more coaches along the way, simply for the fact that, you know, I might invest three grand, five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand. But if I build one skill that improves by 10% annually, how that's going to compound on top of my business, it, mm. it's absolutely exponential. It's very hard to see in the beginning. However, it's an essential you know, lesson if you want to be able to build your business the fastest way possible. Right. That's awesome. I think that, uh, I mean, that's, it's vital. And, you know, I look back and go, oh, I've had multiple coaches, you know, one for different phases of my career and life. And, you know, was, I used to race bicycles and for a while I didn't have a coach and I was like looking around for one. And it's like, I know I can improve, but I need direction. And, um, it's, it, to me, it's been one of the most beneficial things that I've done. Um, what would you say, um, well, let me go back to this. Let me, so how did you, let's go back. I want to, I, I kind of move around a little bit on, you know, where my brain is with this whole thing and getting to know who you are and what you're doing, what makes you tick. So let's go back to when did you, like you started writing a lot of articles and was this just for your blog? Was this for a magazine? Was this just because you were using it as a, as a practical skill to you know, create some knowledge for yourself and find the information? So how, where, where were you writing them? What were you like, what was your purpose and what were some of the topics that you were, you were finding that your coaching clients or your, your training clients were having trouble with and that you were writing on? Yeah. So for me, I started looking at the other people who were successful in doing what I wanted to do in terms of building, you know, so uh, John Romanello, Nate Green, some of these younger guys that had kind of been pioneers in terms of the online coaching space. Mm -hmm. What were they writing? What were they, you know, publishing? Where were they getting featured? And for me, it was like, okay, well, you know, I see what they're doing. They're obviously much better writers than I am, but I'm just going to start writing about my clients' problems. And as I start to mature, you know, that's, that's going to improve. And then really what my process was, you know, probably the place I've been published most now would be, uh, would be teenation.com, which was mm -hmm. absolutely huge in the early 2000s. Not as much anymore, but they still had a ton of great quality content just as the blogosphere has changed. Um, my big focus was, okay, well, if, you know, if, if John is writing for teenation, who's writing for John? Right. And who's writing for the person that's writing for John? How can I get in contact with that person and start to build that relationship? So what I did was I stair-stepped my relationships up and started being able to connect with influencers by connecting with somebody who was right below them in terms of their business, maybe writing something for their blog, helping them out. And then, you know, as, as you know, my skill grew and as a relationship grew, if I needed an introduction, I'd already built the goodwill, goodwill and rapport in order to get that introduction. So this allowed me to stair step my way up to some of the highest profile magazines and highest profile blogs at an early age, simply for the fact that I was, you know, just kind of reverse engineering the process on who was helping who so I could build that same network. Wow, great. And was that, and, and did you start your own blog or online business at that time? Or was this just like well before you even had the idea to do that? I mean, that was kind of the foundation of it. Um, it really just started as a blog, just trying to help my clients. And then I'm like, oh, well, if I'm going to spend all this time writing articles and getting up at 3.30 in the morning before I'm training clients at five, I might as well see if I can make some money on this. Um, and that's when I hired John and really got familiar with the online training component, started building out some of those initial systems, email lists, funnels, and, and really getting those components up and running because that's what, you know, that's just really what led to everything from there. Um, and then really how the online business started taking off was um, I actually left the first position that I was at to go to a different gym, a different sports performance facility. And I figured, you know, these clients already know me. I know them. They trust me. They've been getting great results. Let's see if they want to move online if they're not willing to travel, you know, across the city during the middle of their day. And that gave me my first touch during my first few online training clients, which, you know, started the wonderful aspect of getting some money in that I could reinvest back into the business and draw more attention to what I was doing. So that's how it all started. Yeah, that's awesome. And how long ago was that? Uh, if I look back, almost 2019, that's crazy. Uh, about seven years, a little over seven years. Okay. Well, that's great. And you've had ups and downs in the online business, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely ups and downs, but that's definitely how we learn. Yeah. So I, I think one thing that, um, I, I mean, I ran into myself and, uh, and people run into is they, they start and they think their trajectory is just always straight up, 
but it's, it's not always a straight line. And um, so what are some of the things that you've done when, you know, things are up and down, you know, how are you, how are you, how are you handling that? What are some of the things that you do to, that, that are helping you get through? Like when all of a sudden there are no training clients this month or sales are dropped or you find you have more time here or more time there. What, what are some of the things that you've um, found are successful? Yeah. You know, for me, the biggest, the biggest roadblock I ever faced was um, I had a, a fraudulent accountant who stole $50,000 from my business, which caused a hundred thousand dollar swing. Yeah. And I was uh, about 24, 25 at this point and just getting ready to go out completely on my own as an independent contractor and, and building things from that aspect. Um, so for me, that was a huge, huge eye opener. Um, and I remember getting some very stern advice, you know, from, uh, from the IRS investigator who was going through and, and it was crazy, crazy story. And uh, he said, you know what? Sometimes bad stuff happens to good people, but this is still your responsibility. And, you know, when it comes to it, it that was tough to hear, but the truth is, you know, you might be in a certain situation from extenuating circumstances, or it might not necessarily be your fault, but it is your responsibility to fix that if you're going to have this business grow or, you're, or if you're going to grow as a person. So hearing that at a young age really just kind of set me back in my chair. I took a breath and I thought, okay, I'm in the hole pretty significantly. I've got to pay this back. What am I going to do? And for me, it was like, you know, I can focus on what these goals are, what these numbers, what I have to pay back, what I have to make each, each and every single month, or I can focus on the process that's actually going to get me there. And for me, that just got me back to my roots of like, okay, who am I trying to help? What is the one problem I'm trying to solve? Where can I find those people? Mm -hmm. And from that, it was, okay, cool. I, I already have, you know, clients that are working with me right now, but they also travel. How can I integrate what they're doing in the gym into my online business and, and create a little bit different business model? How can I attract more people with, you know, targeted ads that have the very same exact problems or working in the same industries and how can we build up that perspective? So for me, it came back to when your back is against the wall and um, Damon John talks about this in the book, The Power of Broke, you know, you start to get creative. You start to look and see where those hidden profit centers really are. And for me, it was, I had a, a good amount of cash flow that I could, you know, if I just looked at things a different way directly with my business, then it came back to implementing every single day. And, you know, when I started my blog, I was doing this without even realizing it, but I was taking one proactive step to growing my business every day by writing before the chaos of a full training day took over. So for me, it was that same principle reapplied. If I create high quality content, that's going to be the first thing. It's going to be a proactive step. And I just have to nail that process. Number two, I have to be able to create more conversations because no coaching is ever occurring outside of an initial conversation and building that relationship. So if I can create more conversations through my content, that's going to help. And then number three, having a clear cut objection or objective to be able to help people with and do so in a timely manner by creating, you know, scarcity deadlines um, and just having compelling copy that relates directly to what people are trying to solve and knowing that ideal client intimately. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. That's so great. There's so many nuggets in there. I'm like, all right, we got to talk about all these things. Um, how did you learn about all this stuff? Like, how did you learn about your perfect client, uh, writing sales copy, um, the marketing aspect? Where did you, where did you learn all that stuff? Yeah, for me, um, you know, it started with, with hiring coaches, it started with John. He gave me a really good introduction to a lot of these principles and a lot of these foundational skills. Uh, and then for me, it was, um, some of the best advice that I got from John back in the day was, okay, if you want to be a writer, well, treat like make that your primary job for the next three months meaning you know you should write this much read this like these select books that are going to go deep on that topic to make you a better writer and then just continue practicing that skill so you know what i've done whenever there's a skill that i want to develop what i'll do is i'll actually focus on a set time block and just consume content that's based around that skill set so let's say you want to really improve your, your copywriting in the first quarter of the year coming up well what you would do okay maybe you'd hire a copywriting coach that's one way or a course Maybe you take two courses back to back that are really going to focus on that. And everything that you're reading regarding business is going to be focused on copywriting as well as having a daily practice on it. It's about going an inch wide and a mile deep for a consecutive amount of time rather than doing, oh, I'm going to do a little copywriting here, a little sales here. Let's talk about funnels here. No, mm -hmm. just nail one skill at a time. Make that a piece of what you do. Integrate that into your you know, lifestyle as a habit and something you don't have to necessarily consciously think about 24-7 and move on to the next skill and just continue that process of acquiring these foundational skills that are going to build your business. Wow. So what are some components of like the copywriting that you find is um, most successful? So for instance, a, you know, a landing page or on your website, what are some things that, um, 
that you include that if you look around at other fitness uh, coaches and websites that you're like, oh, they, they didn't include that. They haven't, you know, what, what are some key components that, that maybe everyone should have? And like, what are the, the one or two things that you think that uh, only people in the know are really going to include on their, on their websites and pages? Yeah, so, you know, one of the best activities I've ever done for this actually came from uh, Nathan Berry, who runs ConvertKit. And it was called the 10 person activity. And it comes out to reaching out to your ideal client and finding out what exactly they want in their ideal words. So uh, one of these questions would be, hey, you know what, if I could help you with one thing regarding, say you're trying to do weight loss, regarding losing weight, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And then writing down those exact words. Uh, number two would be, okay, where do you currently you know, consume content as, as it relates to helping you lose weight? Do you read magazines? Which magazines? Do you watch YouTube? Which YouTube channel? Um, this is going to tell you who exactly your competitors are who are doing something right with their messaging and the medium in which they're communicating with the people who you want to be able to help already. And then the third question would be, awesome. So if I was going to help create, um, create YouTube videos on how to, lose, how to lose fat without living in the gym, would you be interested in, in going through a coaching program? Yeah. And then you have 10 leads right off the bat. And you use that information and you continually test out that copy with everything that you're writing. And that's how I came across the idea of, like, hey, I want to look good naked without living in the gym. Uh -huh. uh, I, I knew it was working when people would apply on, on coaching applications and saying, I want to look good naked without living in the gym. Um, so it just comes back to speaking the language that your clients already speak. So you're communicating on a deep level. Um, and I know it's very difficult, especially if you did a science background where you know, we would look good naked without living in the gym. I have no way I would have wrote that, you know, seven years ago. I would have, like, maximized fatty acid mobilization and, you know, lose high quality weight, well, whatever, you know. Um, but it comes back to speaking that language of your client. So you build that trust. They know that you can relate to them. And then it's, you know, showing them how to do it step by step and communicating in a way that they are already, you know, taking information in. So, you know, it, it sounds, the 10 person activity sounds a little complicated, but the lessons are very simple. And then it just comes down to consistently refining the process. And I find that, you know, far too many people will say, ah, this marketing campaign doesn't work. I got to throw everything out and start over. Well, the truth is most marketing campaigns won't work. And it's not that they don't work or that they're broken. It just might not work at that particular time. Or there could be a couple things that are, that are off kilter, you know, with the message or you just haven't stuck with it long enough. And it's very, I know it's, it's very easy to get discouraged when it comes to building a business and trying to find that perfect marketing message but it just takes time. It takes a lot of content. It takes a lot of high touches to refine it. And then once something hits, then you're good. Mm -hmm. So as you're, to go back and summarize, it's find the people that are your, that are your perfect customers, survey them and yep. use their exact language in your copywriting and marketing and not your own language. That's like, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, cause I, I do, I think like you mentioned, a lot of us are like, Oh, I've got all these degrees. I'm really special. I do these techniques. I do these, these exercise training things, but people don't really care about that. They want to look good naked. Right. Yeah. It's, it's figuring out like, yeah. so how do, how do you figure out like, what am I, what are my patients or clients or people like really care about? It's just this survey or is there another way to like extract that info from that? You know, I mean, surveys are one way um, if we're talking purely from an online perspective, but another one is getting to know your clients outside the gym and see what other things they are interested in. So, you know, as, as an example, when I, was, uh, when I was in Denver, Colorado, I was working with a lot of clients. Uh, my clients that weren't athletes were a lot of times as working as attorneys. They were working in big oil and gas. Like, okay, like, you know, what else are you doing? What are maybe some of the things that, that could be throwing you off a little bit, but what are, you know, some of the interests that you have? So, um, you know, they were very interested in sports. That worked out very well for me. Um, you know, a lot of the oil and gas guys were bourbon connoisseurs, and that was something that we always kind of um, had to battle a little bit in terms of like, okay, how do we integrate maybe, you know, if you're going to be drinking for social events and for work, how do we integrate mm -hmm. that without completely destroying what you're doing? But knowing that's also an interest, you know, by extension, you know, I started doing some bourbon tastings and enjoying some, you know, some different, different things like that. And that would, I would integrate that into my message. So instead of saying, hey, here's how you go out and have a, you know, have a drink you know, without it completely destroying what you're doing would be like, hey, have you tried this brand new, you know, brand new Walnut Manhattan cocktail, you know, something very specific, because when you say something specific, even if not, even if the majority of people don't relate 100% to that idea, the fact that you go specific is going to catch a couple people and you can be like, wow, it's like they're inside my head or I know this person already. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's looking intimately and really knowing, knowing people on a deeper level and being able to convey that message with your copywriting, with your storytelling, and with the communication that you have on all levels. Right. So, um, 
here's the thing that like I'm gonna the antithesis to that, and I want you to address this because I, I know people think it's like yeah, but it, that wouldn't work for me because I can help everybody, or you know I have people that do more you know more things than just you know drink bourbon or just you know have one issue. What? How would you say that, or how yeah. do you coach your clients on on that when they're like, well, I should be able to speak to everybody and help everybody? Yeah, I totally get that, and that was the same thing that I did when I first started my business. Well. The thing is, if you go too general, you're never going to stand out to such a level that those people you truly want to help are going to be attracted to you over somebody else who specializes in the one thing that they want to accomplish. And once you show people that you can help them accomplish one skill better than probably anyone else in the field, you, you gain that trust. They value your opinion on so many different levels. Uh, when I'm talking to different strength coaches and personal trainers about this, you know, I'll, I'll talk about someone like Eric Cressy. Eric Cressy, very well known in terms of being the shoulder guy. Well, he knows shoulders so well that if I ever have a shoulder issue, he's obviously the guy I'm going to go to. However, knowing that he has that level of expertise and that level, me, I, I, I trust that he has a level of expertise in almost anything I could ask, or he'd be willing to point me in a direction of somebody who does. So being able to show that level of expertise shows a, a, an attention to detail that really is going to help you stand out and apply to different areas. And you'll see the same thing when, um, you know, you'll see people more or less migrate into different fields. Like, oh, wow, they've had a lot of success right here. I mean, you know, people have reached out to me for the business, like the business coaching for me grew from coaches wanting to know how I built my business. Not that I'd had this grandiose plan of making an online, making an online business coach, coaching platform for coaches. It's, I showed a level of expertise in one area and being able to take that like, okay, how did you do this? People start to value your opinion much more in different areas and you never know what else that's going to bring up. Right, right. That's awesome. Would you say that that the, one of the big differences is that you share what you know with people versus hold your cards close to your chest and try to keep it keep the information a secret, or is is that not? Yeah. Play? No, definitely. I mean, I, I used to be. I used to have that mindset where I don't want to tell people my secrets. I don't want them to know everything that I have. But the truth is, all the information is out there. If people want it. What's going to really help you stand out is sharing that information, but then connecting and coming from a place of generosity, you know, reciprocity. When you give, 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 you shall receive on the back end of it. So, you know, especially as you're gaining more education, you're continuing to get certifications and different skill sets that can set you apart. Those things are great. But if you don't share them, no one's going to know that you have them in the first place. And in a world with seven, nine billion people, whatever it is right now, if you truly want to stand out, you have to give away your best information and show that you have that higher level of ability for people to truly trust and believe you. Because at the same time, you know, trust and belief, and especially in the online world, I think is at an all-time low. So you really need to have the social proof and give people a reason to trust that you are an expert. And you're not going to get that if you're holding your best information back. Right. What are some of the other things that uh, that you've done or, or, or recommend that people do to create like expert status, whether it's expert in Greensboro or expert in the United States or, you know, what, what are some of the things I mean, you've done some writing articles or is there anything else that people should be looking at doing for that? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously writing articles helps simply for the fact that you get social proof of having logos on your website. The, uh, the theme used to be collect as many logos as you can. Um, but beyond that, you know, anytime you can do some, some presenting, anytime you can align yourself with other authorities that are in your field, that's going to be incredibly important because when people see you with, with another authority, say, you know, you have a picture with Bedros and Bedros is endorsing you, he's telling his entire audience that knows, likes, and trusts him that, hey, mm -hmm. you know, Aaron is pretty fantastic at what he does. If you have, you know, questions about how to build business, you should also consult with Aaron because he is top notch and world class. So being able to connect with those who are high level professionals who also serve your own audience is absolutely mm -hmm. essential. So, you know, much like we, we talked about the process of writing before, kind of stair-stepping my way up to work with some of the best, you know, publishing companies and websites that were out there. It's the same process, maybe if it comes to networking on social media. Okay, who's an assistant for this influencer? How can you help them? Okay, can you maybe work your way into the community of the person that's the influencer? And then, you know, time and time again, by providing value, they notice you. People notice who comments on their stuff. People notice who interacts with their content. And it's just a matter of time that if you do that and then make a timely ask that you can make that connection and, you know, use that obviously to, to grow your business. But, you know, that all comes from a place of generosity and trying to provide help first and foremost, rather than asking, what can I get from this person? Yeah. Like giving results in advance, right? Exactly. That's exactly it. <laughs> Give something, 
because <clears throat> I think it's, uh, I think one of the things is the keys is, is you, you give, whether it's results or value or help or offer, it's then people feel compelled to return the favor and, and do something for you later on. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you know, I've got this note on my monitor, it's at my monitor at home, and it says, uh, I think it says, ask people about themselves or something like that. It was just my reminder, because my wife was like, Aaron, make sure that you, you ask other people about themselves. I was like, you're right, because I used to just, you know, have be so isolated in my job that I, when I was around people, I just wanted to talk. And it was like, oh, yes, because if you ask people about what they want, what they do, what they like, then they will ask you later. <laughs> Exactly. You know, someone's name is the sweetest word in the English language to them. So, you know, I, I do the same thing. You know, we have a tendency to get isolated, especially trying to build a business. And, you know, your mind goes a million miles a minute, but try to take a step back and, hey, what's going on? What's new in your world? You know, and, and try to start that conversation by, you know, by leading the conversation there. That's so great. So, Eric, what, um, what would you say are some of the, um, are, are some of the other, like attributes or um, characters or qualities of of someone who, that would that would make them that help make them become a great business owner or entrepreneur or some things that you know about yourself that okay this is what makes me makes me great and these are the things that I'm struggling with you know there's some attributes and qualities there that you've identified and and see are helpful or you know pull people aside like being isolated or yeah <laughs> um, you know one would be understanding that sales are the way that you provide value to your clients. Mm -hmm. uh, we all come from a perspective, you know, we pretty much everyone in the fitness industry you know, and health industry comes from a science background. And uh, on the opposite side of science, a lot of times it's kind of that, that sales, the marketing aspect. And because of that, we have this inherent, ugh, when you see, you know, sales, we see marketing advice, especially getting started. Well, the truth is, though, when it comes to having clients that are committed to what they're doing, when it comes to reaching more people, sales are that essential buy-in that needs to happen. As we kind of discussed before, if you give somebody something for free, the chance of them actually taking action and implementing that are very low. When somebody has mm -hmm. skin in the game and truly value what they're doing, they're going to be so much more likely to take action, and you're going to be able to do your job and truly make the difference that you got into the industry for in the first place. So understanding that, that selling and getting comfortable in doing so is an ethical obligation. It's not something that you're trying to convince people to do that you're forcing them or high pressuring them into doing. It's what needs to be done in order for people to buy in and make the necessary change. Because if they do not do something to move away from, you know, situation A where they have these fears and discomforts and can potentially go down a very problematic road when it comes to health and longevity, they're not going to. And sometimes you need a little bit of that push in order to buy in to do what is absolutely necessary. And I believe as practitioners, it is our moral obligation to truly help people if that means that we have to you know tell them this is what's going to happen if you do not make this change do you want to make this here's what's going to here's what the investment is going to be yes or no because it's not necessarily about investing money it's about keeping the problem or not keeping the problem are you going to be proactive about it or reactive and i think that's the biggest thing that that you know sales and marketing advice and, and getting comfortable with those those things that's the most important thing that that coaches and practitioners can do mm -hmm. so what are some of the key components of <clears throat> of selling like a personal training or, or fitness or even just of sales, what are some of the key components that people need to like hit or cover or ask about in order to getting to the point of like, okay, now I've, now I've actually learned how to sell rather than just accepting, you know, taking orders. Yeah. yeah. So I think it all begins with the beginning of a sales call. It's obviously, you know, greeting with energy saying, Hey, Aaron, how are you doing today? You know, and just creating a conversation, depending what your intake form looks like, depending what your intake process is, what's something else that you connect with people to build some rapport because people know what these calls are. They know what this meeting is about. It's about a sale. And as soon as we think something's purely about money or about sales or that, you know, maybe you're trying to get something from them, you know, we instantly clam up. We've all probably been pitched something before and a heart drops and a heart, heart starts to race. So the biggest way to get around that is to start building rapport right away. Um, based off of that, what you want to do is you want to set the frame of what this call or what this conversation is going to look like. Hey, Aaron, so what we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about what you're struggling with in your business. We're going to talk about the steps that you need to take in order to grow from six figures to seven figures. And then if you and I are going to be a great fit, what we'll do is we'll discuss how we can work together. This call will take about 30 minutes. Does that work for you? Yes. So just getting a small agreement, laying out the foundation of what everything is going to look like is a great way to, to show the pace of the call. 
what exactly is going to be covered. And then because you're building some rapport in the beginning, you're disarming people. Now, I'll give you one more here because this happens quite a bit if you do any, any phone sales. Um, but it comes down to, you know, you can answer, you know, one of three ways when it comes to when it comes to making a pitch. Yes, great, we can work together. Two, no, that's fine. You know, if, if we're not a good fit, we're not a good fit. But then three, the dreaded response, hey, can I get back to you? Right. Well, we all know kind of what that generally means. So to kind of get that out of the way, you know, one thing I say right after getting that initial agreement would be, hey, Aaron, can we just have one simple agreement before we jump into the meat of the call? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, when it comes to the end, you can give me one of three answers. Yes, which means I can help you build your business. You'll get to six to seven figures or go from six to seven figures. Two, no, completely fine. Sometimes the program's not right for you. No hard feelings at all. But three, I need to think about it. Well, Aaron, you know, the reason that we're here is because you've already been thinking about this a little bit. And, you know, when you're trying to build a business, it's important to be able to take action quickly. And a lot of times when somebody says, I need to think about it, well, the real answer is no, they just don't want to say it on the phone. And do we have an agreement that, you know, you can at least give me answer one or two, but never number three? Is that cool with you? And then the answer is going to be yes. So right away, you set the frame for the call. You give them guidance what exactly is going to go down. And then you set the frame that at least you're going to get a yes or a no definitively at the end of the call. You don't have to go through that consistently rat racing process. Mm -hmm. And people know that, that you do mean business, but you've also given them a kind of a quick hit of like, you know, taking action and being able to act fast is very important when it comes to business because a lot of people who hold back on these things have thought about it for a long time. They're just trying to collect more information. But, you know, as practitioners we were, and business owners, we realized that more information is not the answer. Action is. So if you put those in the front side of your sales calls, that's going to do a much better job of positioning you both as an authority, but also leading people down an influential conversation, leading towards a clear-cut destination, not necessarily people who are just trying to, you know, use some of your time and collect information that's not going to serve them. Right. That's awesome. And <clears throat> I love that. I, I, I love that. It's it basically just pre-framing people what to expect. And that I think it helps them be more comfortable. Is there a way that would you change the way you say, would say that or adapt that if you were meeting in person with someone about, let's say, you know, coming and working with you in your gym, you know, to do some training? Is it, would it be any different or would it be about the same thing? Um, it's going to def depend on what, when the conversation occurs. Mm -hmm. um, if it's after you've gone through you know, if you've gone through a session or, you know, I remember one gym I worked at did like a three for 99 kind of introduction package. And then after the third call, you'd sit down and have that conversation. Um, so, you know, first, it's going to have to depend on what you feel comfortable with as a trainer, as a coach, as somebody who's having that conversation, simply for the fact that if you are not clear on what the expectations are, and if you fumble around in your sales call, it, you position yourself as somebody who doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about. So you have to be comfortable in whatever conversation or however you're going to frame it. So when it comes to maybe that third option, what it would be like, hey, so, you know, you've had great results over these first three sessions. But, you know, what we've discussed is you've been trying to sign your own for the last three years. So, you know, based on this conversation, based on the last three weeks, the one answer that, you know, that just won't work for either one of us, or won't serve either one of us is going to be, I need to think about it more because we've been thinking about it as we've gone through these sessions. Is that fair? And then I just, just ask, them, is that fair? And people are just like, yeah, that's very understanding. Um, so it's going to depend a little bit on the client. You know, if you have somebody with, you know, different backgrounds, it's going to be a little bit different. But, um, you know, skill comes from the practice of, of just setting those behaviors and getting comfortable in knowing that you offer a very high value service. And this is what needs to happen in order for somebody to take action and transform their life. Okay. So you get to the end of that sales call and someone goes, well, I do need to talk to my spouse. That wasn't one of the uh, pre-agreed questions that you said wasn't going to work. How, yeah. do you that? How do you handle that objection when that comes up? So one funny part that you mentioned that is I actually, uh, before I have somebody who hops on a sales call, you know, I, I send them a couple of gifts and get things warmed mm -hmm. up in advance. And I just ask if they do have that spouse coming or if they have anybody else that they need to discuss finances with, please have them on the call. So I, I do normally try to do that. But however, if you would still get an objection like that, um, the first thing I would do is like, okay, you know, what would your spouse say? Yeah. And it's kind of way because a lot of times what people are really doing is, you know, they're deflecting. Um, mm. They don't want to make a decision. They're trying to use their spouse to you know, more or less shield them from having the an uncomfortable yes or a no, which is completely fine. You know, I'm, I'm married. I get it, you know, 100%. Um, but a lot of times what happens is they're going to tell you what the true objection is. Like, oh, well, I don't know what they're going to say. Like, okay, well, with your spouse, are they going to be more upset about the price or is it more about the product itself? no, the product is great. It's just a big investment right now. And really from here, what you can do is 
you can take this a couple different directions. First, you want to agree, like, yes, it is a big investment. Um, you know, so you can go with a hard close, like, but you know, here's really the thing, you know, before you told me that we'd say kind of a yes or a no here. And the truth is you haven't been getting results on your own. So you can either keep the problem, keep staying in pain, keep struggling with your business, or you can invest to, to make the solution. And that's what I'm here to help you do, which will it be? That's the hard route. Um, alternatively, pry a little bit deeper. Okay, so you mentioned it was the price. So would it be helpful if we broke up the payments a little bit differently? And that gives you a little bit of, of time to you know, get at least some monetary commitment and then figure out some of the details later on, whether it means extending the payment program, whether it means divvying it up a little bit differently. Because sometimes, you know, right now, uh, you know, it could be somebody struggling to pay for different bills. Like maybe they have, you know, a big tax bill that came up out of nowhere. Maybe it's the holidays. You know, be a human first. And that's one of the beautiful things about having a smaller, a smaller business and rather than a just giant large corporation who's very rigid, you know, you can have that deep connection. Like, okay, so if this is the right program for you, what I want to do for you is, is really help you out here. And, you know, if finances are a little bit tough, here's exactly what we can do. We can do, you know, 10% down and then we'll break this up and have a little bit different payment structure for the rest of the way. That way you have the financial flexibility right now, but you also have the immediate ability to start taking action, to be able to start, you know, building up your income, fixing whatever pain point that they have. So you get a couple of different options which you can take there. But again, it comes down to what you're comfortable doing when it comes to providing that service for your clients. Wow, that's awesome. I love that. And I love hearing the way other people say the same thing, you know, in different ways. Because so, I mean, one, it always helps me and I hope it helps the listeners because it's, we get a lot of people objecting about getting started. Some people object of paying a copay for $25 and some people object to paying a, a cash-based physical therapy service for 250 or more. And the objections are always the same. It's, um, you know, it's, it's lack of understanding what they're going to get or confidence that it's going to work for them, et cetera. And um, so thank you for sharing that. Cause that's really, it's like, like, yes, I want to hear how other successful people do it because it's something that, you know, I think, I don't know if you've had this issue with yourself. It's like, I feel like sometimes when I first started meeting objections, I wanted to be nice. You know, I didn't want to like, you know, be like, but you just told me you've been living in pain for six months and you're here. Like, why aren't you willing to move forward? And, um, I mean, have you, you've had that, um, ex those experiences before I'd like, I just want to be nice. I was like, okay, whatever, you know, yeah. you just do your thing, go on. Right. Yeah, definitely. Same thing. And you know, you have to get comfortable asking tough questions because like first and foremost, our job is not to be someone's friend. It's to help them solve a particular problem. So, you know, even going through the, the sales process and through this conversation, I'll, I'll ask something like Aaron, you know, my number one role as a coach is like, I have to hold you accountable. And sometimes that means I have to ask tough questions. So do I have permission to ask a couple tough and, and fairly direct questions to you right now? So I'll use that and I'll kind of disarm it. And then I'll say, you know, what happens if you do not, you know, do not take action towards fixing X, Y, and Z goal. Mm -hmm. And we'll dig in, we'll dig in deep to some of those things because if people don't realize the pain of staying the same and where that can, where that can spiral downhill, they're not going to do it necessarily necessary in order to make the change that they need to get to get better to succeed. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. What's the um, like when you're close, like, so you've got someone to agree. So they, they go through a sales process and you ask them the right questions and they're like, yes, Eric, I'm ready to, you know, ready to move on. What's the, um, how do you close people into the contract? Like what are the, is there like a script or certain words or just a phrase you use when you're getting someone's agreement at the end of a sales call or, or sit down with them about uh, continuing on and working? Yeah. So I guess, are you asking more specifically about when price does come up and what that pitch looks like or after mm -hmm. they've agreed to it? Um, after they the kind of, I guess the pitch, more of the pitch about, okay, when price comes up, how do you pitch it? Um, and you know, so after the, yeah, so let's talk about the price, the pitch part of it. Okay. So yeah, we'll go through, obviously we're having, you know, we've got all the questions, we've got pain points, all that stuff is ready. And, um, you know, basically it comes to a position of like, Aaron, can I tell you a little bit more about the program? Yes. We kind of go through that. And you know, what comes up here is I generally do an A, B style close. I have an upfront payment option or a month to month. The most important thing when you do in, when you have an A, B type close is that you do not end on the price. You end on the product and the service and the benefits that they're going to get. Mm -hmm. So for example, Aaron, you, we have two different options here to get you started towards building your business up from six figures to seven figures over the next six months. So you could save 500 bucks up front and do a $4,500 upfront payment 
or you can have the flexibility of a month to month payment, $1,000 per month over the course of five months. Between those two financial options, which would be the better option for you? So you can build your business and get to that next level. Mm -hmm. That's great. So yeah, just positioning it that way, because like I said, as soon as price comes up, we've all been there. It's, we go back to that kind of lizard brain mentality and then kind of sinks up and, and we get, we get fearful. But again, we're not trying to sell somebody on anything. What we're trying to do is provide a solution to a problem. Therefore you provide the solution at the tail end of your, um, of your pitch. Yeah. What is, um, how did you get to the point where you felt comfortable, you know, like tossing out like high figure numbers for people, whether it's for training or coaching, like, you know, cause I know like, you know, people are struggle with, Oh, like, how do I justify charging X when I know it's expensive for, you know, you know, people start to have second guessing themselves on their own price with their rates and that like, what, did, what are some of the things that you did that got you comfortable selling high yeah. ticket, you know, training and, and coaching? Yeah, for me, it was just a, just a lot of practice in terms of going through the sales process and getting comfortable with that first and foremost. Uh, but then it was also seeing, you know, when I was first, when I was first getting into training, I remember I worked with a number of attorneys who easily talked me down, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of what my rate should have been, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, you know, at the time. And I also realized that those clients a lot of times weren't as focused on doing what was necessarily needed because, you know, they figured they got a deal versus something like, damn, this is expensive. I really have to make it work. That's a mindset shift in the, in, in the customer, you know? So when we value something more, we're going to be able to take more action. And I noticed that, okay, when I offered a higher value service, therefore charge a higher rate, people who are paying more, were more committed, getting better results. And being a results-based business, having, helping or being able to put skin in the game and having people truly committed, knowing that like, I made this big financial investment, I need to knock this out, is a very, very powerful aspect in terms of delivering results. So, you know, for me, it was a gradual build. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't a trainer for a year and then I started trying to sell like $10,000 a year like coaching packages, but it was a gradual kind of increase as I felt comfortable with it, occasionally getting outside of my comfort zone with, with what seemed, um, what seemed normal. But the thing is like, if you provide the value, if you provide that great high quality service that, you know, that, that you set the expectation for with your clients, mm -hmm. you know, then, then everything works out. But it just came down to a lot of practice and then consistently increasing those rates as your value increases. And that's something that we all struggle with, especially, you know, in fitness and in health, you know, we're not necessarily in a position to get a raise from a, from a company every single year that also improves our benefits, gives us stock options and all these different components. Meanwhile, inflation and those components continue, continue to increase. So on one end of it as well, it's part of being a business owner, knowing that, you know, your prices do need to increase over time, especially as your expenses are going up. That's simply the way that, you know, that the economy works. And, mm -hmm. and that's another process and piece of it. What um, <clears throat> would you mind sharing? Like, I don't, don't even know, like what you're like, are you still, well, let me ask you, are you still training people? You're still training people through your performance um, business, right? Is that right? Online, you're yes. So doing yeah. online training. What are some of the, um, where did you start with, would you mind sharing? Where did you start with your training packages, like prices and just some details about them and, and what are you doing now and how did you transition? Because one, I want, I want to know because I know a lot of personal trainers charge more than physical therapists do. And then, and I want to, one, I want people to know that, that like, you know, like dentists charge more. Yes. But some dentists charge less, but I want to know people like, yeah. the va I know the value you provide. I'm going to preface this with saying the value that you provide as a fitness professional is extremely high because you're in the part of the journey where people do get injured or before they get injured. And that's always the place that I was like, I want people to come to me first, but they end up, they're, they're really seeing someone else and then they, they get hurt and they go to the orthopedic surgeon. They skip this whole section of the, of the spectrum that I'm in. Um, so, you know, would you mind sharing us like just a little, some details about, you know, where did you start when you, I think you had had a job that you left um, to start your own business. Where are you now? And how'd you, how'd you get there? Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, especially pricing and stuff like that, um, you know, my first couple of clients, you know, I was, you figure things out on the go, especially with the online training component. One thing that was really beneficial was I saw how these people moved. I knew what movement issues that they had directly in the gym, what I need to be careful with. I was able to more or less use those as some good initial client profiles to know what was off limits and what wasn't in terms of online coaching and then what services needed to be rendered in order to get them to that next level. So that helped me really in the beginning just kind of get an overall idea of what I needed to be doing. 
which helped me buy into to what my rates were. Kind of a long answer there, but I'll get around to it. Nice. Um, so yeah, my, my first couple of people, I think they're paying about a hundred bucks a month and just every single month on auto bill. And, and that was it for the online coaching component. Um, you know, as demand started to increase, as I started, you know, having more social proof behind the business um, and my time got it more in demand and my services improved, I just gradually, I would increase about 50 bucks a month after every three um, every five to 10 clients, something like that. So it's a really gradual kind of stair step model in terms of improve, increasing my rates to the position now where, you know, if you're going to work with me and not, you know, somebody else that, that's working for me at Bach Performance, it's going to be $5,000 for a year of, of online coaching uh, with the fitness aspect. So um, it's just been a process of continually evolving in, in improving my skills. And as my skills improve, imp increase my rates. And, you know, as that's happened, I've gotten people who are more and more committed to making those results happen. Um, so. Now, I'm not sure if there's like a higher, like a, a higher limit. I know people, some people have charged some very extreme prices when it comes to online programs, so on and so forth. But again, it comes down to someone's level of commitment. You know, there's a reason, you know, if, uh, if you buy a Ferrari, you're going to really value that Ferrari versus if you buy a, you know, a, a Honda Pilot or something. And nothing against Honda Pilot, it's a great car, but you got a Ferrari, you're going to take care of that thing. You're really going to make sure that it's top notch versus something else. So there is also that perspective of it. Right. That's awesome. And how long are you spent? Like, what's your kind of, what are your touch points with your coaching clients these days? Is it, you know, email, weekly emails? Is it um, weekly check-ins? You know, like you're just writing programs for them. How, what, what are those, what does that look like? Yeah, so it depends on the program itself. Um, so we're talking like my higher level program. We do we do two coaching calls per month. So we have those. Uh, we have a, a private app where you have unlimited messaging access there. I generally check that twice per day. Mm -hmm. uh, we have very focused check-in on Fridays. And then, like I said, during the week, if they have anything else, we're checking each and every single day. So, you know, they get a lot of contact, a lot of things that they can do. They can send us different exercise videos that we can break down. Like, okay, we've got a little bit, you know, of like lateral shift here. Maybe we've got to add in some, you know, some unilateral work to uncover these movement imbalances, so on and so forth. So we can go fairly high touch with what these are. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's coaching and it has to be high touch to an extent and provide that level of service, especially if we're going to provide a good high quality service to our clients from the first place. Dude, that's really awesome. Um, what, uh, what are some things that if someone's getting started in an online business, um, re, what, what are some things that they need to make sure that they're doing or paying attention to um, so they don't make the, make a mistake or or miss something that maybe you missed or, you know, like what would be like those one or two things that like they need to make sure that they do to, to really make a big impact and ensure the success of the business. Yeah. I'm going to go with a uh, kind of an old school tip here yeah. right away. Start collecting your own lead base via an email list. You know, I mean, email obviously open rates and all that stuff are down, but um, I've, I've seen so many coaches that have really good like follow, followings on social media, but they have no repeatable system for generating revenue or know where their customers are. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to having that base and control over your marketing, it's being able, you know, if, create a free gift for your ideal client, something that's going to give them a quick win and solving that number one problem, get them into, get them into an email list. And even if you just share maybe your top performing social media post once a week and just continue to build that relationship and position yourself as the expert, that's what you need. Some people, are very quick, spontaneous buyers. They see one thing that you have and they're sold. Others, it takes years and lots of touch points because they're very conservative in terms of their thought process and who they want to hire and, and what everything looks like. The best way to, to really get both is to provide high content on a regular basis and then control your own lead generation, your lead flow with a repeatable system over time. Wow, that's important. Yeah, I think I 100% I agree. I've seen so many people, I'm like, you know, email your list. They're like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't have any, I've, I've seen thousands of patients and I have no one's email. I'm like, you want to, you want, you want some quick business? Just email your list. Like, I don't have email. So I, I think that's great. So thank you. Um, what, uh, Eric, what would you say has been the, maybe the biggest mistake or the toughest thing that you've had to deal with um, in growing your business that you would go back and change? I think the toughest thing we mentioned a little bit before was kind of going through this, uh, this whole accounting ordeal where uh, like an accountant stole over $50,000 from my business, which was like a hundred thousand dollar swing in a very you know short period of time. So on one hand, it gave me, um, 
they really challenged me mentally, which gave me a lot of tools that I needed. But at the same time, um, I think it also had given me some limiting beliefs in terms of like scarcity. Like I always need like, you know, it's always great to have a cushion, but um, for a bit, I had been more or less a little bit afraid to reinvest in different areas of the business simply yeah. for the fact that like, what if another, you know, criminal accountant like does something like this and fund another rainy day? Um, obviously, we have a rainy day fund just as a smart business practice, but you can't let some of these past experiences of fear prevent your future growth. Um, unfortunately, yeah, like, you know, bad situations do happen. They do happen in business. Rough times will happen. However, you have to keep going. You have to plow through. Being an entrepreneur, different. it's a different headspace. Like, you, you have to be very resilient to these things, but um, you just got to keep going and, you know, don't let some of these past situations hold you back. That's awesome. What, um, is there anything else you'd like to share based on our conversation that you think is important or did I leave, did I leave out or anything like that? You know, I think we touched on it in the surface level, but you know, the most important thing, especially if, if things get crazy, if life gets crazy, if business seems stressful, focus on the process itself and just do those daily tasks day in and day out. When you focus on the process, the outcomes will come along but don't get confused. Don't try to find, you know, that magic solution. Just keep hammering. Consistency will win out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Eric, thank you for coming on the show today. It's been great getting to know you and your business and um, having a conversation with you. What, what are, if someone wants to find you online, where should they go? Yeah, probably the easiest place for me would be uh, be Instagram. So Instagram at Bach Performance. That's spelled just like the composer, B-A-C-H, followed by performance. Um, I focus mostly on fitness information there. Um, occasionally, I touch on the business stuff. But um, if you're interested more of the business angle content that we talked about today, go to BachBusinessCoaching.com. A uh, ton of great client stories that you can see a lot of really good takeaways, some of the same things that we talked about today, as well as consistent lessons to help you build your business going forward. That's really awesome. Eric, thank you so much. And we'll put your links on the show notes. And I really appreciate you spending the time with us here today and sharing your knowledge. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Aaron, thank you. I had a blast. Hopefully everyone got some great value from this call. And we'll talk soon. All right. This is Aaron LeBauer and Eric Bach from the Cash PG Lunch Hour. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much.